As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for that. Hey, this is a little bit of a throwback for how many ever years it's been. Probably back to when we first came to Australia, but anyway. As the deer, sing it with me. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship me. You, my friend, and you are my brother even though you are a king I love you more than any other so much more anything you alone are my strength my shield alone may my spirit heal you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee I want you more than gold or silver only you can sigh you alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit be. Alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship me. We'll just leave that tag off for now and ask God's blessings on our time together this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you. And Lord, the, the music that we've sung this morning is, is the desire of our hearts and and sometimes we're pretty good at it with your help, and sometimes we're not so good. Dear God, uh, help us to long for you and truly bind us together in love as we should be. Lord, I pray a special blessing on everyone who's come our way this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, thank you. You may be seated. Introduce them this morning. This is Ian and Joe Walter. And um, we're going to bring them up in just a few moments after their video presentation. I'm going to have a few questions and answers for them. But we'll start with the video. It'll give you a lot of information. And then they'll be available for some chats after church today. Ian and Joe, thank you so much. Let's give them a warm grace. Welcome. Ready to go with the video? Okay. Thank you. 
I've known Ian and Joe for nearly 30 years, uh, which is a long time to know anybody, for, or for them to put up with me for that much time. But um, they've got a great story. Pull it up closer. Yep, that's good. So you guys make sure you, we got a wireless mic over here, good, to use. Um, Ian and Joe have a, a wonderful story about how they came to the Lord. Uh, and I'm going to let them share that if they want to, and then uh, talk a little bit about Bill Dave Ministries. Obviously, they're, as you've watched it, you put the pieces together. You understand that they build structures to help people, missionaries, to do the job that they have to do. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about your the early days, how it got started. Bill Dade Ministry, because you were a carpenter, you worked in the hospital? No. No, you were... No, so we, um, we first came... I grew up in a Christian home. Um, I would say that loosely. We went to church every Sunday, but I didn't really have a relationship um, with Christ until we moved to Warrnambool. Um, <clears throat> I went to university and I worked at a university as a, teach, uh, as a tutor. Um, but then I um, was doing my Masters in Communication and we ended up in Melbourne um, following my career, I suppose. But we met um, the pastor of our church, Tim and Tammy, yep. and that's how come we met you eventually. Yeah, right. um, and so we, were, we were, became members of the Warrnambool Baptist, uh, Independent Baptist Church back then, and we were saved at that church at that time. Yeah. So. There's no man here. It was only just a... He was about this. Uh, <laughs> a little bigger than that, but he was... Not very, not very big, yes. 36, 37 years ago? Yeah, it would have been. So we moved to Melbourne in 1987. Yeah. Oh, and nice. um, our founding members at, at um, Suburban um, Church in Hoppers yeah. Crossing. Um, and we've been there ever since. Very, and, very good. Yeah. I'll let Ian explain how build out there. So yeah, how to build out stuff. Well, well so this man standing here beside me. <laughs> yeah. Probably 14 years ago, he come knocking on my door one morning and says, look, I've got a missionary couple in trouble. They've been transferred from one missionary agency to another missionary agency, and they've got four kids in the jungle, and they need a hand. Are you willing to go help? That's right. So that's how it started. I went to PNG, yep. helped them out, and then six months later, I went back to their house again, helped them out again, and then come back home, and then two years later, this same person knocked on my door, and you would have seen the Richards home, the first project. Yes, the yeah, so um, they needed a hand to build a house, and so I decided to go and have a look and do a field trip, see what I could do. And the Lord had got a big piece of 90 by 45 and whacked me over the head out there in the field and said, "How am I going to do this being part time?" And then from then on, everywhere I went, every sermon, even youth group stuff I used to turn, attend, everyone was saying, you need to close up your building business and head to the mission fields full time. Um, that was a big commitment. And back then, it was when the global financial pressure was on, and the building industry was going down, and we went from building, probably turning over probably 30 to 40 homes a year to about two or three. So the Lord made a way for us to, to go out, but financially we weren't in the best the spot. And I was prepared to sell our house back then, mm. but I had a, a board that made us keep it and the way the Lord has looked after us in that way has been fantastic over the last 12 years. And back then I didn't know how we'd have a house, but we've still got our house now and yeah. yeah and we just, yeah, we've got lots to do. All right, you hold on to that in case you need to ask plan. the next oh, one. Stop right. waving it around. <laughs> I'm not a speaker. <laughs> That's all right. So uh, you have to think about missionaries going to a place like Papua New Guinea or Vanuatu or even places like um, YWAM here in the country and the fact that they need someone many times 
Ian's got so much work to do that he could do just to build structures or to help repair structures <coughs> for some of these missionaries. So uh, one of the things that is also a big part of build aid is for him to take crews from churches to Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, wherever it is, uh, to for a week, two weeks, two weeks, two no, weeks. Normally, I take most first timers to humid, humid countries for two weeks yeah. because it does send people a bit stir crazy after about two weeks. The condition, the intense humidity, and all that type of stuff. And yeah. you know, we have we have a relaxing time. This last trip, we had, you know, we got to go swim because we were in the capital. We got to go to a couple of resorts and go for a swim and get a bit of downtime. But when you're out in the middle of the jungle, out in the middle of nowhere, there's no, there's no restaurants to go to. If you're overweight, I can guarantee you'll lose 10 kilos in, a, in the two weeks you're there, for sure. So. And how far is it to the closest bunnies? Closest bunnies. <laughs> okay. Now, we'll go in towns, it's the closest bunnies. But then, if you go to the outer island, it's anywhere from two week boat trip to three months depending on when the boat's coming or the barge is coming to when you so you've got to plan well in, a, in advance yeah. and at the moment the shipping is all over the place and everyone's all over the place since COVID. Yeah good. All right is there anything else you want to share and then we're going to pray for you? Well the project's coming up. Yep. Richard's house. Richard's have been back in America for now it's probably two years, two years. Two years. Yep. Their house has been emptied, so it's going to need a team to go in there before they go back in to clean it. So that's a good project, so you know, there can be a good mixture of people um, to help clean the house. There's another couple that work with them, the Ellis's, their, their house is 14 k's up the road, that needs to be cleaned at night. So that, that's one of the first projects we probably have to do in June. And then we've got to go back to V2 Life, you've seen the container ship, we have to unpack that probably, probably May, probably go and unpack that. So yeah, lots to do. And one more before I go, COVID was, you know, threw us all about and it really threw us into a mess because we couldn't go do what we wanted to do. And it's been great to be home with this one for the last three years. And I really found it difficult the last two weeks to be away again. So sure. So I can get her to come more often. That'd be good. Yeah, because that'd be great. Not that I don't yeah. want to. Do you have anything you want to add? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that even though COVID hit us, it did actually um, provide us with opportunities to do other things, and you would have seen on their project in Geelong. So that's called the House of Hope, which is a women's um, centre for women with substance abuse. It's currently a men's shelter that fails its 14, 14, about 14 men. Um, but there was nowhere in the in the Geelong or that sort of south. West area for women who had any any sort of substance abuse to to be accommodated out of their their situation. So this this women's refuge that we're building in conjunction with Foundation 61 um, will will provide a place for women and sometimes their small children, if that's the case, to be safely accommodated. Um, they're cared for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, and they can come and go within reason. I think there's some, there are some conditions about their coming and going until they, until they are re rehabilitated. But our, our, the project was clearly put there by God because we had nothing to do for a couple of years and now we're right into that project. We need to see that through. And you would have seen there was a quick slide of a, a working meeting. We can share more details with that if anyone's interested in coming to give us a hand at a couple of working meetings. Right. Yeah. So the Lord provides for us even, and we've, yeah, we've got work coming out of our ears and eyes and wherever else. Um, and um, but it's a blessing. But yeah, I would like to be able to go more often. And the reason why I don't get to go is because we're not fully supported. So that's a prayer point for us, particularly. I think that's really important. Thanks. Um, we're going to pray. Hey, Steve, do you mind coming and praying for Ian and Joe? Would you be willing to do that for me, buddy? Thank you so much because you've done them. As long as I have, if not longer. Longer, yes, because you were born of all days. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this um, couple, Lord, that have been willing to give up life and comfort in this country, Lord, to serve you how you placed it on their hearts. And Lord, we thank you for their faithfulness, for their willingness to go, and for the blessing that they've been. Lord, we just pray that you would continue to support them and give them the strength they need. 
And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for the, the blessing and the, and the work that they've done in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would love for the church to be more involved in Build Aid Ministries. We can have a chat about that in the future. Ian and Joe are good people who serve God faithfully and have served him faithfully for a lot of years and I'm so thankful for that. Um, above all powers, above all kings, before we get into the message, so can you be upstanding with me again, please? Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you Laid behind the stone You live to die Rejected and alone Like a rose Trampled on the ground You took the fall And thought of me Above all Behind the stone You live to die Rejected and alone Like a rose Trampled on the ground You took the fall And thought of me Above all Thought of me above all. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. If you will, open your Bibles to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. We're looking, looked at this passage of Scripture as an overview last week. And it's time for us to dig a little bit deeper into this wonderful passage of Scripture. And hopefully I believe that it has the songs and what we've heard this morning from Ian and Joe as well. Have prepared our hearts for the truth of God's Word. So I'd like to start by asking you a question. And if you think you know the answer... Then raise your hand and share it. If you're not sure, do like everybody else does and say, well, let's wait and see what somebody else says. All right. So what is the difference between character and reputation? Who's got a, a quick answer for me? Anybody? What's the difference between character and reputation? Yes, Stephen. Thanks. Exactly right. Character is who you are when no one's watching you. Do you have integrity in that space? Reputation is what people think you are. I had a teacher, a good friend of mine, who said the other day, 
When I see you in that leather backpack, it reminds me of Jesus. And I got to thinking, you know, I hope there's something else in my life that reminds me of Jesus other than just the backpack. But if you want to be like Jesus, you just wear your leather backpack and it's all done. I'm joking, of course. I'm not even serious about that. But character and reputation. Benjamin Franklin said, <clears throat> it takes many good deeds to build a reputation, and how many to ruin it? Just one. Abraham Lincoln. Character is like a tree, and reputation is like the shadow. The shadow is what we think of it, and the tree is the real thing. Character is what you are. It's who you are. It might be your moral compass, what you believe is the right and wrong, and that could be based on the Word of God or it could be just the way you were raised or how you feel in your heart about what's right and wrong, but that's who, what your character is. Or the discipline of your mind and actions, and again, reputation is what people think you are, or what people think of you. And most of us want a sterling character, don't we? We do. And most of us want a reputation that is above reproach. And both are important, except for one thing. You can choose what your character is, but you cannot choose what your reputation is. And what I'd like to do this morning in our discussion together is I would like to turn this idea of reputation on its head as we look into God's Word. And you say, goodness gracious me, how do you get reputation out of John chapter 17 verses 1 to 5? Well, hopefully, I'm going to help you to see that this morning. This isn't a message necessarily about our character and reputation. But it is a look at Jesus and His singular focus on His relationship with the Father. It is both about His character and His reputation, but not about what people thought of Him, but what God thinks of Him. We know from the Scriptures what people thought of Jesus, don't we? Some believed he was a great teacher. Some believed, others believed that he was from Satan, didn't they? Because of what he did. So Jesus had a reputation that was pretty checkered, if you will. But that said nothing about his character because we have the truth of the Word of God. And so we look into the Word of God and we say, well, that's who Jesus is, that's who Jesus was, and so we're going to look at that as in relation to this passage of Scripture. But let's look at the first five verses of John chapter 17. Everyone with me on your device in your Bible, the, the hard copy, the, I don't care, just so long as you're looking at the Bible, that's a good thing. When Jesus had spoken these words, remember that's just the end of chapter 16 and verse 1. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace in the world. You will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world, Jesus said. And when he had spoken these words, he transitions from this dialogue with his disciples to his prayer to God. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him and this is eternal life that you know the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do and now father glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, the word glory came from a word which means something that belongs to God. We read through the Old Testament, if you were to look at each of the passages that had the word glory in it, and it starts from the beginning and goes all the way to, to Malachi, in those passages of Scripture, you see the word glory. 
But the fact of the matter is, in our English context, we will talk about, and I was reading something just this morning. Oh, the, the singing was glorious. Oh, this, this building is glorious. Oh, this food is just absolutely glorious. And what we've done is we've dumbed the words down or changed the meaning of the word in our own context. And I don't think we fully appreciate the magnitude of the word glory in the Old Testament, the New Testament. So one of the things, one of my, my things for you this morning is to give you a greater sight of the glory of God. I don't know if that's even possible, but by the Spirit of God working in you as you listen to the Word of God. But so, for the moment, think not about your English use of the words, but think about the biblical use of the word glory this morning. So, the, in the Old Testament, anything that had to do with God was glory. And it was something that was weighty and important and something that really, really mattered. If it was glory in the Old Testament, it had two applications. Two applications in the Old Testament. One application was one of authority. If God was to be glorified, it was because He had all authority in the world. And there was nobody else who was over Him that had more authority. God was and is the supreme authority of the world. So this idea of glory came with that, that uh, 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 idea or understanding of God being in authority. But here's an interesting thing about the word glory. God gave glory to human beings and gave them authority over the earth. Because he created man in his own image and he gave in the garden. He said, Adam and Eve, here's the garden. You are to have dominion over this garden and over the animals and over the fish and the birds. And God gave glory, authority, even to man. Psalm 40 talks about that. I didn't pick that just up out of the air. That's biblical. We also think, so the first thing is authority. The second thing about glory is the visibility of God, right? When we think of Moses, well, that's the first thing I thought about. When I thought about the visibility of God and its effect on mankind, I thought about the children of Israel in the wilderness and the glory of God, the Shekinah glory that settled on the tabernacle, right? Exactly. The radiance of the presence of God's glory is found in the book of Exodus so many times. And do you remember Moses, Moses goes up on the mountain the first time? Right? And God gives him the Ten Commandments. And he comes back down the mountain, Mount Sinai, and he sees Aaron and the people worshiping a golden calf. And he thinks, you sorry people. And he grabs the Ten Commandments and he throws them down and breaks them. Right? You know the story. And is that the last of the story of the Ten Commandments? No. Not at all, because God says, come on back up here, Moses. You've got another job to do. And this time, God says, you take the Ten Commandments and you do the work. That's interesting, isn't it? Oh, I, God. Who, who can understand the mind of God? God does it the first time. Moses breaks him because he's so angry at the people. God calls Moses back up on the mountain and says, you've got a job to do, but this time it's going to be a little bit harder. You're going to take the chisel and the hammer. And you're going to take the piece of stone and you're going to chisel out the Ten Commandments. Forty days, Moses is on the mountain doing the work. But here's where I want to go with this. He comes down from the mountain after 40 days and what did the people see? Moses' face was so bright and shiny. Just draw a picture of a happy face and do the little sun thing coming out. That's Moses. They couldn't look on him because his face was shining with what? The glory of God. My face never shines with the glory of God. I, I'll just be honest with you. But Moses' face, so much so that he had to put a veil over his face because the people could not look at him. Forty days on Mount Sinai. Ezekiel talks about 
God. Exodus chapter 40, the glory of God filled the tabernacle. I mentioned that earlier, but there's your passage of scripture, Exodus chapter 40. In other examples of God's glory is found in Ezekiel. And this is what Ezekiel says. So I got up and went to, out to the plain and beheld, behold, the glory of the Lord was present there like the glory I'd seen by the river Kibar, and I fell face down. And the glory of the Lord rose up from within the city and stood over the mountain east of the city. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. So that's Ezekiel. Ezekiel sees the glory of God. One of the passages that I thought about in, in relation to the glory of God is found in Isaiah chapter 6 and verses 1 to 5. Isaiah chapter 6 and verses 1 to 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one called to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the voice was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And so in this passage in Isaiah, we see the glory of God. Now, I've given you that Old Testament background and just a smattering, just a look at it, in order that we would understand John chapter 17, verses 1 to 5 again. Quickly look at those verses and tell me how many times you see the word glory or glorify in that short passage of Scripture. Do a quick count while I get a drink of water. Oh, first. All right, who, got, who has a number? How many is it? Same. Six, Six, five, nine. How many? Six. Six times. Everybody agrees? Six times. Five verses, six times. Glory. I didn't count them. I just wanted to see if you were paying attention. <clears throat> but is this the first time that we've seen the glory of God in John's gospel? As a matter of fact, many commentators call John's gospel the glorious gospel because he uses the word glory so much. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, John 1, 14, and the word, that is the Lord Jesus, the Logos, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and this is what John says, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's John's introduction to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have seen His glory, glory as if the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus had purposefully controlled the aspects of His ministry until the time was completely right for the fulfillment. That is, up until this time, up until he was 30, as far as we, the scripture tells us, there were no miracles, there was nothing else that would indicate who he was. Mary knew, Joseph knew, Jesus knew, I guarantee you his brothers and sisters knew that there was something pretty special about him. But until Jesus reveals himself, it's carefully controlled until the timing was right. It seems like he is downplaying who he really is without concern about what people thought about him. Because up until this time, they only thought of Jesus as being the son of Joseph of Nazareth, the carpenter, the son of Mary and Joseph. But then we have John's Gospel, the Revelation, his beginning of the ministry. And then we go back to John chapter 13. So if you want to back up, just because this is the beginning of the upper room discourse that we've been working through for so many weeks now. John chapter 13, verse, I'll start at verse 35, no, I'll start at verse 31. And when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. 
Little children, yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. But if you look in the verses 31, 32, it's so clearly about the glorification of the, of the Lord Jesus through God himself. Now we go back to John chapter 17 in just a little bit. And the word that we're using, that John's gospel uses for the word glory is different, of course, from the Old Testament because it's the Greek. Any guesses as to what the word is? It's a word that's familiar to you, maybe. Glory. No ideas? Well, how many of you have ever sung at some point in your life the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Have you sung that? The doxology. Yeah. So doxology is a hymn of praise to God. Right? The word doxa is the word that is used here in the New Testament in John's Gospel. It is, as I said, the word from which we get doxology, a hymn of praise. And some people think that this is the glory of God to praise God. But the fact of the matter is that is only a small part of the word doxa. Doxa has something to do with someone's estimation or assessment. So it's like reputation. The word is only used positively in the New Testament. So the estimation is always good and honorable. According to Thayer, who's a wise theologian, Doxa literally means what evokes good opinion. That is, that something has inherent or intrinsic worth. So when we prayed this morning, I think it was Yeshua who prayed, Lord, you alone are worthy as giving glory to God. Do you see that? We've had it demonstrated for us this morning. When the Bible speaks of God's glory using the word doxa, it means that God has infinite intrinsic worth. His character and essence are worthy of honor and highest esteem. And God is glorious in that His very being is of an infinite significance. And the highest goal of Jesus was to bring glory to God. Now here's where the rubber, as it were, meets the road. For Jesus and for you and me. The highest goal of Jesus was to glorify God. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20 says, I'm not going to read all of it just for time, but the scripture says in that passage of scripture, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. We know that Jesus Christ, the incarnate God, had the fullness of deity in him. So what we see in this passage of scripture, by God's, the Lord Jesus' goal to glorify God, and though that may seem a little bit difficult for you to get your head around because Jesus is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, we often refer to him as, he is God in the flesh, how in the world is he glorifying God? But as you see the separation between Jesus, the Son of God, and God the Father, you will see that this oneness is because He gives glory to God. And so we see the revelation of the person of the Father as is part of His highest goal. When Jesus said, glorify your Son, it was to say that this, His goal was to have the glory of God not only on Him, but that through Him, the glory of the Father was to be more fully understood and revealed to all mankind. He was asking that His earthly ministry would be such that the Father's will would be done in Him for all the world to see. And this is a transformation from His ministry in Jerusalem and Galilee to a pivotal point in all history of the entire world. Up until this point, his ministry is very tight and secluded. Yes, people came to listen to his teaching. They came to have bread and, and lunch divided and multiplied for him. Yes, they came to see his miracles. 
They even came to him just a few days prior to this at the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But overall, his ministry was very localized. And all of a sudden, we are seeing Jesus saying, I want the whole world to be able to see that God is glorified in me and that I am revealing the person of God to the world. God's goal, highest goal to glorify the Father. We see a revelation of the power of the Father. Jesus says in John chapter 17, verse 5, you are 1 to 5, You have given him authority over all flesh to give it eternal life to all whom you have given him. Again, we sense the use of the word glory in this word of authority. We know that from the foundation of the world, the Son, the Word, the Logos had this power from creation onward. And when we see the power again manifested in creation, as Colossians has already told us, that we may know the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Revelation of the person of the Father, revelation of the power, and now we see this purpose that is so much a part of what the Scripture has to say as, as well. And the Lord Jesus says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. That was Jesus' goal. I'm glorifying God. You've given me a job to do. And that's what I want to keep on doing. But we also see this last thing we see again, once again, the revelation of the presence of the Father in this passage of Scripture. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. I don't know about you, but if I stop and think about what that means, I could be there for days and days. The glory of God, the Son being with Him, the Logos from eternity past, from we can't even think beyond our time frame. But there's God, always has been, always will be. And the Son always has been. And the glory. And then there was that time when the Lord Jesus, the Logos, the Word, left that glory to come. We used to sing a song. Do you remember John and Jackie? Down from His glory, ever living story. Well, it's off key. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Down from His glory, Jesus came. Became a screaming little baby that had to have his nappy changed and had to be fed. Oh my goodness. The glory of God in a little baby. It's an amazing and rich passage of Scripture, both on the glory of God and how Jesus prays in this supernatural bond with God the Father to be glorified as God was glorified. And this was the very essence of the union with the Father that he would stay focused on and accomplishing the will of the Father that his life would be the perfect sacrifice to be the atonement for our sins. His death, burial, and resurrection to show the love, grace, and mercy of God to the Father to redeem those who believe in him. We are not part of the Trinity. I hate to tell you that, break that news to you, but we're not part of the Trinity at all. But we are adopted into the family of God and we are called sons of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And in that context, I want you to think with me again about the idea of yours and my reputations. Oh, we're back to that again. So if we use the Lord Jesus as our example, what should our greatest goal be? To glorify God. Would our lives reveal the person of the Father? Would our lives reveal the power of the Father by our faith and prayer? Would our lives reveal His purpose and His will in our lives? Would we reveal the presence of the Father like Moses did? Or like the disciples in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. Listen to this. Now when the men of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court, saw the confidence and boldness of Peter and John. And grasped the fact that they were uneducated and untrained 
ordinary men, they were astounded and began to recognize what? That they had been with Jesus. So if I'm talking about reputation, I'm talking about your character for sure. And our character should be one with God. God's will to be done. And our reputation should be, as people see us, that we have been with Jesus. So, our reputation should not be so much what people think of us, but what people think of God. Can we say that our lives bring glory to God? I want you to turn with me back to Luke chapter 6. Because we as Christians, we want God to be pleased with us. And there's a lot of us who feel like that if everybody's happy with us, then that's, that's a bonus. But that's not always going to be the case. People may not understand why Joe and Ian have given up careers to follow God. You may have family members that say, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Why would you be willing to sell your house? So that you can build somebody else's house in Vanuatu, for crying out loud. Or Papua New Guinea. Why would you do that? Call of God. Let me just read this passage of scripture. This is from the Beatitudes, Luke chapter 6. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Listen to this, verse 22. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil. There goes your reputation out the door, doesn't it? Yeah, that's not a very nice feeling. When people say, your name is evil. I like my name. I don't want people to think my name is evil, to be honest. But here's the key. Here's the kicker. On account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did the prophets. Not everybody's going to look at you favorably when you do the will of God. Your reputation might take a big, bit of a beating, a kicking, if you do what's right. And sometimes when you follow the Lord's will and you do what's right, regardless of the consequences, regardless of how people think about it, regardless of how people misread your actions, if God is glorified, that's the only thing that really matters. That is the only thing that really matters. That's what Jesus did, John chapter 17, in this beginning of this intercessory prayer. That God would be glorified. That his reputation would be not what people thought, but what God thought about his word. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, you're a good and gracious God. And you give us the, the word of God to help us to understand both your mind and your will so that we can follow you and trust you. Not only for our salvation, but for our daily living. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus that gets us on the right road to heaven, forgives us of our sin, but gives us strength to carry on and to do the will of God day by day. Lord, we ask for mercy and grace. We thank you for that, for each day of our life. In Jesus' name I pray. We have a, a final song. May the Lord find us faithful.
would you be upstanding with me again? Let the thoughts ring true in your heart this morning. <coughs> Thank you. 